So this is our debate, and the debate that we're going to have today, first off, I have to start with a question, when will we reach net zero? And we have to start with both of your answers and see where that takes us first. So Javier, I kind of wanted to start with you. Well, how are we going to see net zero by our lifetimes? Uh, first of all, Ashad here has a lot of advantage because he's 10 years younger than me, which means that he's about 15. <laughs> um, is that okay, right? let's assume that I, 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 I live another 40 years. Um, <laughs> are we going to reach net zero in the next 40 years? No, I don't think that we are going to reach net zero in the next 40 years. I think that demand for fossil fuels is a lot more sticky than we think. And to me, COVID was really a shock. Because if you think about how little oil demand in particular fell during COVID. I mean, you think about that really dark period of March and um, April of two years ago, 2020. Mm -hmm. um, lots of people in North America and in Europe were at home. In some European countries, there were very hard lockdowns. We, we could leave in, in London only for exercising one hour a day. Uh, this is my first long haul trip um, in two years. And even at the peak of COVID, at the peak of no travel, everyone working from home, uh, lots of hundreds of millions of people on lockdown, and global oil demand only dropped around 20%, 20 million barrels a day. We were still consuming at that peak 80 million barrels a day. And that to me was a sense of how sticky uh, oil demand and fossil fuel demand is and is gonna remain. So I'm on the pessimistic side and even if I'm lucky enough to live the next 40 years, I don't think that we will be reaching net zero by then. Hmm. Akshay? So I get 50 years, right? Because I'm 10 years younger. <laughs> there we go. We're going to calculate this later. Now, if we reach net zero by 2070, we actually meet the Paris goal of 2 degrees Celsius. We'll miss 1.5, but we'll meet 2 degrees Celsius. That goal was seen as unachievable when the Paris Agreement was signed. That was just seven years ago. And so, what we've seen is an acceleration of how much technology can go further to be able to cut demand. Javier is absolutely right that the, the system as it exists today is completely dependent on fossil fuels. 80% of all energy comes from fossil fuels. But the marginal gain in energy demand is almost all being met, at least in the rich world, by renewables. And we will start seeing that happening even in developing countries pretty soon. So, you know, in a 50 year period where you have, uh, you know, we went from a world where you used to mine and burn, and we still do that, to a world of energy that's going to be manufacture and optimize. And the trajectories, those two uh, frameworks take are very different. They are, they are, you know, the, the latter one is driven by technology developments, and we know with smartphones, but now with solar panels, with turbines, with batteries, what can be achieved, and I feel like 50 years is enough time to reach net zero. Well, and I mean, you mentioned this a little bit, Akshat, but so much of it is sort of contingent on a lot of these other factors. You mentioned technology. So maybe we could just go through some of those factors that maybe will help us or slow down um, you know, our path to net zero. Javier, maybe let's, let's start with technology, right? Akshat brought this up. Will this help us? Are we, are we making the right investments right now into renewable technology in order to get us closer to net zero? Uh, we are making the investments, but we need a lot more, and we needed we needed to, to happen a lot quicker. Uh, so we are going to need more capital uh, into new technologies that they are going to speed up the transition. If we are to reach the, the the point of net zero, we need we need more more investment in in technology. But at the time that we start investing in those technologies, and those technologies become more widespread, we have seen um, a huge drop in cost on a lot of the technologies, solar panels in particular wind uh, electricity, batteries uh, has been extraordinary. But as we try to move that from being a niche market into a much larger uh, and widespread adoption, we're beginning to see also the bottlenecks. We see costs increasing. Mm -hmm. And that is what worries me. Yes, technology is going to help. But when we move those technologies into widespread adaptation, I think that costs may start increasing. And we need to factor that. Mm. Akshay? I agree. Um, I think uh, if we talked about renewable energy technologies 10 years ago, they were almost all driven by subsidies and government largesse. 
right now we have come to a point where in majority of the world, not just in rich countries, but majority of the world, these are subsidy free technologies, right? And we are also in a paradigm where we have fossil fuels prices spiking, and that's not a new thing. Boom and bust cycle is how the fossil fuel world works. Um, and if you just look at pure economics, we're not talking about climate pressures or political pressures. An economist's case for a requirement of something that spikes and falls, they'd much prefer something that's slightly more expensive but stable for decades to come. And I think that is why uh, technology trends will actually be supportive, well, even though we might get some slight increase because of metals problems or supply chain issues where solar panels this year are going to cost more than they did last year, same with batteries. But that price increase is very small relative to, you know, a uh, 100% increase in the price of uh, oil. But you think that that needs to be factored into this whole calculus because consumers are not going to adopt this, right, if it's not the right price, right? I, I just worry that we are in, in a paradigm of the last few years in which technology has driven prices down for new energy. And, and, and we have always assumed that the next, the following year, things will get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And maybe we are reaching the limits of that. It's still very remarkable how cheap um, any of the new energies, and particularly batteries, have come. Mm. When you think of the, the, the drop in battery costs over the last 20 years, it's just remarkable. Mm. Okay. On consumer preferences, you're right. Like, um, would we choose the green alternative yeah. uh, if it were the same as a fossil fuel one? Um, in electric cars, I think we've kind of given the answer. Uh, once you, you make the charging problem with, you know, in certain places solved, yeah. then the electric car is a better car, you want to drive that. Mm -hmm. But would that be true of electricity, which is a commodity? No. So you're going to have to make the case again and again and again, as we see more climate impacts, that your choice of green alternative is not just for you, but also for the rest of the planet. Mm. All right, let's tackle another issue that is uh, also, you know, what we need to think about when we think about net zero. And that's, of course, something that we've all been focused on for a while, the war in Ukraine, um, and sort of how that's trickled into trade and supply. Javier, does that, does what we're seeing right now speed up or slow down our transition to net zero? I think, unfortunately, the, the war in Ukraine, for the time being, is going to slow down things. Um, because two we factors. Have time. Uh, well, well, yes, uh, that's that's the big problem. But I I I, I fear that security of supply is going to be the main priority of governments for the next 12 to 24 months. Um, th there is, um, I think that governments in Europe will prefer to be able to rely more on green energy, but. Um, at the end of the day, you need to keep Europe warm next winter, and you need to avoid blackouts. And I, what I'm hearing from policymakers, if that means burning more coal, so be it. And that's, that's the priority. And nothing will be more disrupted to the climate change agenda that is starting to see problems on energy supply, because that, that will probably jeopardize more. H however, um, for the medium term, at the moment, I, I see the, the, the current energy situation as uh, we, got, we got into a car accident and we have driven the patient into the ER, and the doctors are on triage. And at the moment, there is no moment for, for playing nice or anything. We need to stop the bleeding. And, and later, we will try to make sure that there is no the scars and everything looks nice. So at the moment is triage, and the next few months are going to be priorities, energy security. COP27 is going to feel very different to COP26. But my hope is that you know, in a year's time for COP28, we are start refocusing on, on climate change. And what has been also a wake-up call now is that a lot of people say, well, but new energies are insecure because you depend on the weather, whether the sun is shining or the wind is blowing, et cetera, et cetera. Well, fossil fuels are proving also very insecure. You depend on whether Vladimir Putin wakes up that morning and decides to keep the supply of gas or not the supply of gas. So the, this notion that fossil fuels are super safe for energy security is completely false. Um, so yes, on the short term, it's a setback and probably it's gonna delay the, the climate change agenda, but I think that hopefully we can refocus it in a few months time, perhaps in a year's time. Mm. You agree, Akshat? 
He just made the case for me. <laughs> well, I think I'll just add to what the case he's already made, which I think is perfectly right, which is short term, you're going to see an increase in emissions. You speak to the most climate optimistic person and they have to face the reality that that's what's going to happen. But in the long term, Javier's hope is that we'll go towards these technologies. And I believe we will go towards these technologies faster because of what we've seen, because of the issue that Javier raised about unreliability of supply. The, the problem there, and I, and I agree to, I, and I said it's my hope, the problem there that I see is that all of a sudden um, we are going to lock ourselves farther, uh, farther into fossil fuel technologies. Right. Uh, China is going to continue building more coal mines and more uh, coal power plants. And the moment that you have made those investments, yes. we know that those investments are sticky, yes. that, that it takes time to, to move on. You have already spent the capex. You are not going to write it down. That is my big concern. And this was the concern that we had when COVID happened. You know, when COVID happened, people were like, oh my God, people, governments are completely going to give up on the green agenda. You know, there's a pandemic and we need to take care of uh, people. And we did that to some extent and uh, not well in some places. But the green agenda didn't die. Uh, if anything, people doubled down. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, uh, you know, again, Javier is right that uh, there is a risk of lock-in of us having to build, you know, especially in the rich world, because developing countries are anyway building these assets. They might increase it by, you know, a little bit more. But would we end up building a coal mine in Europe or in, in, uh, uh, in America? We are certainly building LNG terminals. Germany has said that that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But what's been interesting in the past two months is I've not seen enough lock-in examples. We've been trying to find an example of an actual LNG terminal being built or you know approved. They're talking about it. They haven't approved it. Coal. Nobody's talking about uh, building a new coal pump. Yes, they'll China reopen. Is. Yes, China is, but China. not Europe and America. No, yes. Europe and America is different. But emerging markets. Uh, that's what my concern is. I mean, China is yeah. building 300 million tons of extra coal capacity, yeah. and those mines are going to be there, and they are going to lock them in. I mean, 300 million tons of coal is a lot of not coal. Enough. Yeah, I mean, that, multiply that by two, and uh, if, you, if that's an annual capacity, that's 600 million tons of emissions or you know, 900 million tons of emissions annually added. So right. yeah, so there is a risk of that happening if the developing countries really do that. But I do feel if, if green technologies really are at price parity, which you know, all the numbers say they are, then how much more can they keep going down the fossil fuel? The, the other problem, very briefly, of the war in Ukraine, which I, I think that perhaps is the biggest obstacle, is that it's increasing the cost of a number of commodities that we need for the energy transition. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ashad is right, those, those increases are marginal in the final product and obviously pale in comparison with the increases on gas prices or oil prices. But we need a lot of steel for windmills, we need a lot of nickel for Tesla batteries, etc., etc. And all of, all of the sudden those commodities have got very expensive and one of um, the, the sad things of the invasion uh, of Ukraine by Russia is that Russia is a huge provider of commodities that we need also for the energy transition. It's not just an exporter of uh, dirty fossil fuels like oil, coal and, oil, and, and, and gas. It is also an exporter of nickel, which is absolutely key for batteries. It's an exporter, it's a huge producer of aluminium. And we need a lot of aluminium if we want to make cars lighter, so the range of the batteries are, go farther. Big producer of copper. Um, so we need to think about Russia differently, not just as this exporter of fossil fuels, but also this exporter of key materials that we need for the transition. Right. And, and again, Avi is right that uh, with these metals, again, what we'll see is a price increase, and we're already seeing that. I mean, nickel prices have been crazy in the past few months. Uh, you know, copper prices have been rising for a while. Same with lithium prices. Um, there is, however, again, a technology trend that helps, which is there are replacements available. Earlier, we had Jagdeep Singh, the uh, CEO of QuantumScape, which is a battery uh, maker. They were building their battery with a nickel cathode with one of the electrodes being made of nickel and other metals, mm -hmm. they're happy to replace that with iron and still be able to provide, if not as much performance, uh, you know, still a step change from where they are. So there are alternatives possible and price signals make that uh, happen.
Well, and the complication, too, with the war is we don't know how long it's going to go, right? So, I mean, how long can people hold out for, you know, these prices to be spiked the way that they are? I mean, how much time do we actually have? Uh, I don't know. And, uh, anyone who, who gives you a view of the war, I, I think that, you know, you need to be inside the head of Vladimir Putin to know how long this is going to play out. I mean, what we have seen is that at the moment it seems that we are going for the long run. Uh, this is not going to be something that is going to be resolved in the next few weeks. And, and it has been a huge shock into the system. I mean, even if the war ends tomorrow, will Europe ever trade with Russia in the same terms that it used to trade? We will ever Europe of the United States be relying on any commodity coming from Russia? Uh, and the, the answer is I, I really struggle to see that as long as Vladimir Putin is, is the president of the country. So um, uh, it, it, it complicates a lot of the situation. The other big problem of the war in Russia is that it has complicated massively uh, global policy making. And it's, it's across everything, and climate change is part of that global policy making discussion. I mean, how we are going to have a deal at the next COP27 or the following one where you need to, you, you need a number of key countries sitting on the table. You need Europe, you need the United States, you need Japan, you need Russia, you need China, you need India, you need Saudi Arabia. And a lot of those countries are completely split now uh, in global politics, more than ever. Uh, and I, I fear that you know, climate change may be a victim of that acrimony that countries find very difficult to reach a, a deal. The G20 as, a, as an organization is effectively dead. I mean, the meeting will still take place, but I don't expect much coming from the G20. And the G20 is really the key kind of precursor of, of climate change negotiations. Yes, and I think uh, in the IPCC reports that come out every uh, few years, we've had two recently, you know, you see these curves of emissions falling after a certain time. And that's, you know, the most efficient way in which you can do it. And that requires global coordination. Um, and so this is certainly going to, you know, throw a wrench in the works. However, if you look at the history of climate diplomacy, there's always been actors who have been opposed to uh, making any, uh, any, um, any uh, consensus happen. Mm -hmm. So Saudi Arabia famously has put in a clause in the uh, UNFCCC, which is the framework under which all the COP meetings happen, mm -hmm. to require that there be a consensus. Every country says yes, only then there is an agreement. And despite that uh, problem that was created 30 years ago, we did get the Paris Agreement. We did get what happened in Glasgow. And COP27 and 28 were going to be different any which way. They were going to happen in Egypt uh, the first COP in, in an African country where energy security and energy access is a problem. Yeah. It was going to happen in UAE, which is an oil uh, giant. Yes, they have a net zero goal and they want to try and do more on renewables, but those were going to be different. They just get a little more complicated, not completely yeah. off track. Do you, are you optimistic, though, about some of the negotiations that are happening in 2022? Or, or is there any optimism that you can leave us with? I mean. Akshay, you're being a little bit optimistic, but Javier, <laughs> trying to get something out of Javier. Yeah. Uh, I, I have been, I have been pessimistic because, geez, I mean everything that it could go wrong in 2022 has been so far going pretty wrong. <laughs> I mean we, we were emerging from COVID, and I kind of was thinking that you know we were going to get a break, and uh, I mean and, you know that sounds horrible from here when you you, you see the, the devastation that is happening in Ukraine. So complaining from the comfort of, of New York and this city is, is, is ridiculous. But um, yeah, the year has not been going very well. I mean, the, the only positive that I could see is that we keep the conversation going, that climate change has not completely dropped out of the agenda, mm. that policymakers still have it. And even we are in triage on, you know, focusing on energy security, and, you know, the German government has very difficult decisions in the next few days about how literally they are going to keep, they are going to avoid a massive recession in the country and be able to keep Germans heat and warm next winter. But we are still having the discussion about climate change. And I think that that's, that's the positive. Hmm. If I were to take an optimistic view, then there is something that is outside the energy and uh, diplomacy sphere that probably you know, helps the uh, climate agenda. And that's uh, the response that the West has had towards this aggression, this war from Russia. Mm. Uh, you've seen countries come together, at least in blocks, 
uh, and work and coordinate uh, to actually act. And so when there is an emergency, you can see countries trying to do that. We've also seen with Macron's election that democracy still holds sway and that there are powers that would like to be able to participate in the global conversation, in the European conversation, if there isn't a global one. Um, and we're going to require, I mean, the IPCC scenarios make it very clear that you're going to require coordination. If that coordination is within blocks, that's better than no coordination at all. I mean, one thing that my final point, it kind of relates to technology, but also public perceptions, and, and, and sometimes you need an external event to force uh, movement. Um, you know, that, that is, is a controversial issue, but I have been advocating publicly for nuclear technology and nuclear power. The crisis in, in Ukraine, the invasion of, of Ukraine by Russia, has given uh, nuclear uh, perhaps a, a second chance that without it probably will not have had. And for some countries, that's going to be very important. I mean, just putting aside whether Germany is going to keep the nuclear power reactors open or not this year, which I, I think that in some ways it may be a, a sideshow. I'm more interested in what Japan is going to do, what South Korea is going to do. We see the movements that the UK is taking. It will be very interesting what uh, the crisis means for a country like um, the United States and nuclear policy. Mm. Yeah. Yep. All right, I think we have a little bit of time for questions, but I don't know if we have, Meg, do we have any questions? Oh. Yes, we have some questions. Yes. So a lot of people were asking about different energy sources. So I'll just kind of go through and we can kind of do them one at a time. Nuclear was one, so you, you kind of addressed that a little bit, but other ones that were mentioned, just what you think, how this will help the transition or hurt the transition, hydrogen, um, other quasi -ener green energy sources like hydro, nuclear, um, and I think, the, so that was pretty much probably it. So mostly hydrogen and hydro, I think, were the ones that haven't been addressed. I think the hydrogen case is actually quite fascinating. Where gas prices are today, hydrogen has already become economical. It was supposed to become economical by 2025, 2030, if you were being, you know, pessimistic. But that's already happening with the gas prices where they are today. Of course, that doesn't mean we suddenly have an industry that can uh, spit out electrolyzers uh, at, at, at scale. And so that, you know, we, even if cross parity has been reached, we won't actually see an impact from hydrogen for a few years to come. Hmm. Um, yeah. How does high population dense nations like Brazil or Indonesia or other parts of APAC with less investments in renewables due to budget shortages have a buy-in with the Sustainable Green Zero Emissions Initiative? Global investment, rich nations providing aid for green alternatives, how does that work? I mean, this is a, this is a Javier point, actually. Like, <laughs> it, you know, one of the reasons why the transition has been slower than it could have been, sure, it's been faster than many predicted, but it's been slower than what we need is because not enough investments has been uh, going towards developing countries, especially in, and it's not just Brazil and Indonesia, which are actually large economies, it's the smaller countries that have no capacity whatsoever to ever build a manufacturing base uh, uh, and have to always import these technologies. Um, and that is a, an issue that it is going to require global coordination. You know, governments can't agree to uh, spend $100 billion a year out of a $100 trillion economy. That's a problem, and it's, uh, it's one that, uh, you know, is improving, but not, not fast enough. On, on that, um, you know, it, it, it relates to subsidies, but one, one that worries me is uh, how some develop, developed countries, rich countries, United States and, and Europe in particular, are channeling now subsidies into fossil fuel yeah. again. Uh, we are subsidizing demand. Uh, I completely understand that politically it's very difficult to say that to the public, take $4 a gallon gasoline, although in London, Asha and I pay about $8 a gallon for, for the gasoline. Oh. Um, perhaps one of the reasons that we are using the bicycle. But um, uh, look, governments need to support poor families when they're facing a huge struggle on the supermarket at the pump. But blanket subsidies like France have approved $9 billion that the United Kingdom approved recently to reduce the fuel duty, or the proposal in Canada, uh, sorry, excuse me, on California to send $400 debit card to every Californian uh, family with own one or two cars, $800, regardless of income. So someone in, in a poor district gets whether, uh, the same money as someone who is living in Malibu uh, and driving a Ferrari. Uh, that is absolutely nonsense. And, and, and I think that governments need to get very serious about not locking in subsidies on fossil fuels right now. 
and focusing on, on the families that actually need the support. It's actually worse because it's not just subsidies, actual cash being given to burn more fuel, but the fact that we don't tax here in America mostly uh, fuel at all is a subsidy. The fact that you're allowing people to put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere is a Without subsidy. Without taxing it, yeah. Right? But there are places where you can use real examples. So India, for example, uh, when oil prices were falling, increased taxes, so kept fuel prices at the pump the same, and then it reduced taxes recently while oil prices were going up. So for the people at the pump, it didn't feel much of a difference. Yeah. And that's a, that's a solution that can be pulled off. Yeah, unfortunately, we're out of time, but we can't leave without asking the audience a question, yes. right? Uh, so I was asking Akshat and Javier at the beginning, if we're going to reach net zero well, by we, their lifetime. we reach it in my lifetime? Yes, in or their lifetime. lifetime. So we're going to ask the audience, no matter what decade you were born in, raise of hands if you think we will reach net zero by your lifetime, in your lifetime. Okay, it's like split, guys. Oh, uh, that's wow. a very that's pessimistic a... audience. I know. Ah. <laughs> okay, this well. This is a green <laughs> conference. You have to be more optimistic. <laughs> we're trying. Well, you left now I'm living very good. pessimistic. Everybody should bike. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the, my only solution now is I'll leave Arshad. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. Thanks, thank everybody. You. <laughs>